He's the technical team lead at Session Digital. Uh, he's a big time um, fanatic of testing and pro uh, promotes good testing and is a big uh, community contributor. He is Mr. James Cowie. Cool. So yeah, I mean, massive thanks to Tony, Gabby, John, everyone that's managed to put this event on. It's pretty special to have an afternoon where we can all geek out and talk about Magento and Magento 2. So I'm going to talk to you today about what I class as being the deconstructed Magento module. As Tony said, I'm James, technical team lead at Session. And if you want to find me on Twitter, it's just at jcowie. But what does deconstruction actually mean? So when I was looking into doing these slides, it was, it was quite easy to say, ah, oh, the deconstructed module, we just deconstruct away from Magento. But I wanted to actually look at what deconstruction actually meant in the English dictionary. So to deconstruct is to take apart or examine in order to reveal the bias or composition, often within the intention of exposing biases, flaws, or inconsistencies. And that made me even more confused. So how does that even translate to software engineering? To take apart and look for biases? It felt quite strange, but yet it was what I was trying to do when I wanted to understand how software engineering and how deconstructed software engineering could actually work. So I started to think about deconstruction in terms of software. What does it mean to deconstruct a class, a method, an entire application? And that led me to the law of Demeter, or LOD. Uh, it's not a wrestling group anymore, apparently. They all died a few years back, um, unfortunately. But it's the principle of least knowledge. And it's a design guideline for developing software, particularly object-oriented programs, in a general form. The law of Demeter is a specific case of loose coupling. What it actually means is don't talk to strangers. So the, talk, the definition that I just showed sounded really posh, really complicated into actually achieving software engineering. But it means that class A shouldn't really need to talk to anyone that it doesn't know about already. So great. What, what's decoupled code that we hear about then? If we're trying to deconstruct, what, what, does, what does it mean to be coupled? Well, we talk about tight coupling, and the definition that Wikipedia says is tight coupling is where a group of classes are highly dependent on one another. So we've probably seen the type of class in Magento 1, many of the earlier Symfony projects, quite a lot of PHP and generalized applications where you try and hunt down what this one individual get price or get a special price does. And instead of it being in a single model, it's actually spread all the way across the application. So it's calling methods on other classes. It's in the quote object, in the sale, in the checkout object. So that's where we refer to tight coupling, where it's spread all around the framework. It's not in a single isolated place. On the other hand, loose coupling is, well, the definition says it quite well, is where each of the system's module has or makes use of little or no knowledge of the definitions of the other separate modules. So really, if we look for a sales module, its definition of get final price is just in that one class. Instead of it being separated across many different classes, it's in a single place. And while we're looking at coupling, we, we come across this notion of cohesion and what cohesion actually means. So we say a module with high cohesion, it's, it tends to be preferable. So cohesion is our level of learning, level of um, desirability to work with the class. We know it's reusable, it's quite high quality, we know a lot about it and it's easy to read. So we say that that's got high cohesion. On the, low, on the other hand, low cohesion is where a class is quite painful to work with. It's hard to maintain, it's really hard to test because our, our knowledge of it, our likability to that class is really low, it's got low cohesion. And we tend to say that a class can't have low coupling and low cohesion. It's quite hard to get low and low on both scales. It's really easy to attain high cohesion and low coupling just because of the nature of how we write software, how we think about software. And we were talking about deconstructing, how to deconstruct modules. And it lends itself really nicely to the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. So if we're trying to create these... Um, highly or low coupled modules that are easily to change within the system, easily, easily portable, easily to maintain, 
then we should be able to reuse them on projects quite easily. So we should start to think about how we can take these modules, these little pieces of code, and reuse them instead of reinventing the wheel. We can achieve that in the PHP language using traits. Traits were introduced quite recently, and it's a way of us sharing information or sharing methods inside of a class without having to use abstraction. We can use composition. So we hear all the time that we should favor composition over inheritance. Yet in Magento 1, inheritance was king. So we all know how bad of a decision that can lead. If you've got a massive tree of inheritance, it's hard to understand where the method calls are actually coming from, what inherits from what, and how to test that, because over time, the inheritance just becomes so big. If you favor composition, on the other hand, it means that we can actually see what our objects, our objects are composed of. It's easier to see that this module is actually made up of far too many things. It's composed of too many dependencies to make it useful anymore. We're actually starting to create a pretty highly coupled module because we're pulling in so many different dependencies. And it's what Magento 2 did when they first started refactoring Magento 2. When they took one of the earlier versions of Magento and introduced dependency injection, you could see that all of a sudden these classes had 10, 15, 20 dependencies. And it was a way of them understanding, right, we need to refactor this. We need to make sure that it's composed only of what it needs to know about. And we can do that via interfaces. So we can say that this class has to do this. It's got an interface to say this is its public API. This is what it should do. These are the methods that it should implement. And interfaces are a great way of us enforcing the, the way of how our system can use, or should be used. And it also introduces, introduces type checking if we use interfaces correctly. So enough of the boring theoretical talk. Um, we've all come here to have a look at a bit of code. So I thought what we're going to do is build an out-of-stock command that's going to email our store admin using Mandrill because Mandrill's never known to be changed or start charging people. So I went away and created this massive amount of piece of code. So even the projector can do it no justice. So let's break it down into what it does. Uh, yeah, my eyes hurt just trying to think about it. So in Magento 2, to create a command that runs via BIM Magento, we know that we need to create an email command that extends command. There is a bit of di.xml, but that's not needed to actually make our command do anything that we want it to do with Mandrill. So we've got the configure command, which is pretty much stock. It just configures what it does. And we've got our execute function. And that's mainly where all the horrible stuff that you saw before started to live. So I knew that I'm going to have to deal with Mandrill. So I'm using Composer, because that's what all the cool kids do. So I pull in Compo uh, Mandrill, set my API key. I then start setting some variables that Mandrill needs so that it can send out who the email's from, who it should go to, a little bit of body information. I then commit one of the cardinal sins and pull in the object manager instead of relying on any of the factories or repositories inside of Magento 2. And I just make sure that I can filter on all the attributes where stock status is zero. That gets me all of the out of stock products. I can finally loop through them, throw them into a string, finish off some more mandrel variables just because variables are cool and it seems to want loads of them, and finish off by sending the email. So that's what that big class actually did. But as what I was told all the way through school, I must try harder. So attempt one was good. It worked. We probably could have shipped it. But all the logic was enclosed within a single method. There was no reuse. So the chances are that I wanted to use Mandrill not just for sending emails to the admin, but I'm probably going to want to use it for transactional emails. And I'm instantiating a new instance of Mandrill with an API key. So it's all of a sudden really hard for me to maintain the API keys and the implementation of Mandrill across the entire project. It's pretty hard to understand. I mean, there's a lot of setting of variables going on there, a lot of mixture of Magento code, Mandrill code, PHP, and Magento 2 framework-specific code. So, it, I mean, it was quite hard to understand, especially coming into Magento 2. And it's hard to change. For somebody else that comes into it, there's no tests. So if they want to change one of the variables and check that it sends email, it's all manual for them to have to go through, check that it didn't break, so it's, it's quite a, a, a crappy class. And the class is pretty fragile. Again, it's got the cost to change, and it's increasing the project's technical debt. So we talk about fragility because it's got no tests. If it's got no tests, I class a class, class, a class as having high fragility. 
because how are you going to know whether you've broke it or not without running manual tests? Now, running this um, script in a manual test is pretty easy because it's quite a small class anyway. We can check our inbox to make sure that an email's been sent. But if that was dealing with more mission-critical stuff, where we're talking to a remote system, we're going to have to start checking the APIs and responses, returns, and just check that we're actually not breaking anything. So it's really fragile. And we're mixing business logic and framework logic. So it's instantly more fragile because we've combined the two implementations together. It's more fragile to change. Imagine if I upgrade to Magento 2.2 and they've decided to remove Object Manager. Well, that code's knackered. It's really fragile and it's never going to work. The cost of change has increased because, again, email's probably going to be used throughout the entire application. So if we want to swap to another provider, it's many places that we're going to have to find that API key. Again, hard to understand, so the change for people coming in and making an addition is great, it's greater. And we've all got that class in our project's code base where a new starter comes and it's just don't touch that class. It's that class over there. And you're, what class? It can't be that bad. Oh, that class. So don't, don't let it become that class. And I mean, technical debt, we hear it all the time. This class increases our technical debt because it's one that's harder for us to change. Two weeks' time, when Dave, our project manager, comes and wants us to add an additional field, it's that class. Instantly, our quote goes from one hour to two weeks just because we don't want to have to open it, understand it, relearn all the stuff that's happened or happens in that class. So I thought, let's, let's do it a bit better. I can't end on a Magento 2 talk showing you that class because you'll all never listen to me again. So I thought, let's see what our class is actually doing. Well, it's building a set of variables for sending the email. It's getting all the products that are out of stock, and it's finally sending the email. So it's a little bit like what Vinay was saying, where he looked at what his Magento 1 class was doing and decided to start splitting that down. So I wanted to refactor all the things that my class actually did. So I decided to create a model class for the emailer. So it seems pretty sensible. It's doing two things that are email related. It's setting template and sending email. So I created a new um, better email model and put the emailer in there. I created a model for the out of stock products. So it's got a model called out of stock products. And what I actually did here was just copy the code, the body code from example one and just moved it into these two classes. So it's still doing the same object manager call well, at least this time it's in two separate classes. If we did want to start testing the get out of stock or the send email, it's easier because there's less side effects. Instead of having to talk to Magento 2 and talk to Mandrill, we're reducing the number of um, side effects or external influences that we need to mock. And then finally, looking at our command class, I just make sure that I instantiate a new instance of the Mage Titans out of stock product, a new instance of the emailer, set the variables again, and send the email. So a little bit better. At least it's starting to fit on our projector screen a little bit more. And as I say, it's starting to separate out the concerns of our, our project. Now we can see that we've got an emailer class that sends email. That's pretty, pretty sensible. I mean, a command class that sends email is probably not the first place you're going to start looking. It's easier to test because we're starting to make the classes smaller. The method bodies are smaller. They're doing one thing. Each function's doing one Thing, so it should return one output. It's easier to understand. You know, if you want to look for the out of stock um, code, you just look in the out of stock class and the out of stock method body. And we're starting to think about extracting from the framework. So if you look at the emailer model, there's nothing in there that's Magento 2. There's no extend from object manager. There's no Magento 2 anything going on in there. So we're starting to make it easier for developers to not have to be Magento 2 experts. They just need to know how to write PHP. And again, it's starting to get better, but it's not as far as I'd like to show you guys. So I wanted to do a third and final attempt. And this time, go all out. So we're going to create interfaces, and we're going to use dependency injection. So interfaces are used in quite a lot of Magento 2. It's not all there yet. There's a little bit of the core that hasn't got in service contracts implemented. But service contracts are interfaces. That's all they are. They define the public API of what our class can actually do. And it's an amazing advancement inside of Magento 2 because it means that we can rely on certain public methods that we know aren't going to change. 
So in this implementation, I've implemented send and set variables, and it means that I can give my module to any of you guys and say, as long as you write your extensions, only ever work relying on send and set variables, then it's fine. I'm not going to break those. They're always going to return true for send and the variable, I don't know, an array for set variables. But don't look at any of the inside core. If it's private or protected, that's mine. Don't write observers to try and change that because the chances are it's going to break. So we implement our, our service contract. And again, it's a, it is a pretty much a binding contract to developers to say, this is my contract for what I want you as developers to use and rely on. Please don't look inside of it. Don't look at the small print because that's likely to change. But if you rely on the public methods, then we're, looking, we're going to move forward together quite nicely. And it really helps in testing. So if we're injecting an interface into our code, then we can mock that without having to worry about calling a database, sending emails. It's an interface that we can mock, stub, fake quite easily. And it's really inexpensive to do that. So we implement our interface in what I extended to be model email as mandrill.php. So you can see it's quite simple. I use the emailer interface. I implement the interface. And then using the exact same code from the horrible example, I just pasted it into the set variables that returns the array and send that just calls mandrill send. I go back to our command, and I'm glad we've got quite a long string. So in the command handler itself, I have to implement a constructor because we're going to start using dependency injection. So Magento 2 uses dependency injection on the constructor instead of getters, which is really good. So inside of the constructor, I um, inject the or type in the in emailer interface and assign that to emailer. I do the outer stock products, and then I just assign them to some variables so that they can use, be used throughout the class. So I did inject the interface, and the first time I looked at this, maybe in the symphony land, it's like, wow, you can't inject interfaces. That's nonsense. I'm a PHP developer. There's no way you can put an interface in there. It's not going to load. It's going to throw an error. But just, just trust me, it'll be okay. So if we go back into our execute command, we can see that I can pull out using the emailer, which is the interface that I injected in, call set variables, and then I can call emailer send, pass in the template, pass in the variables, and call in the instance of out of stock products. I can just throw that in. So a method that was about 60, 70 lines of code to do all the setting, sending, parsing, is now down to two lines, four if we class new line breaks. So it's instantly a lot more easier for people to read and understand what this is doing. Ah, I can see that it's setting some variables, it's sending an email, and one of the options is some out-of-stock products. So I presume it's going to be sending an out-of-stock email. Pretty much anyone that can read English could probably understand what that's trying to achieve. And how the interface is injected is done in Magento 2's di.xml. So Magento 2 implemented its own dependency injection container, which is a great idea because what they did with Symfony and the Zend one that got depreciated just wasn't up to what Magento 2 needed to do. And what it allows us to do is use the preference keyword. So in di.xml, if we want to replace an interface with a concrete implementation, we can use a preference. So we say, my preference, Magento, is for you to watch out for the emailer interface. Anytime Magento 2 sees the emailer interface trying to be injected anywhere in one of the constructors, it's going to swap that and implement my concrete implementation. So Magento is going to uh, DI compile time, or if we were running developer mode, watch out for emailer interface. And instead of the interface getting injected into the class itself, it's going to be the Mandrill implementation. So it is going to be a concrete implementation so that we can just use it as we would do in our code. But then all hell breaks loose, and Kalen, who's famous on the internet, throws a hissy fit on Twitter. <laughs> Only, it was a well-justified hissy fit. But Mandrill decided to change their pricing. And all of a sudden, we can't use Mandrill anymore. So our boss says to us, quick, get Sengrid on there. Normally, we'd all be panicking because we have to copy and paste in our code. We have to find all the instances of Mandrill, make sure we replace them with new instances of a class. By actually implementing it this way, we can create a new emailer client, modify the one line in our di.xml, and instantly our application has changed from using Mandrill 
to SendGrid or PHP implementation. So I know a lot of the time people use di.xml as a way of saying we can swap out MySQL for MongoDB, and it's, it's always quite a far-fetched example. But there we can actually see the power of dependency injection and actually being able to swap out the implementation that we're trying to use. So yeah, say we did need to build our own PHP client. All we'd need to do is implement email or interface again, use some horrible mail command, set some variables on it, update the di.xml, it's a small typo, but it should say PHP client at the end of the preference for, and that's going to inject our PHP client implementation, simple as. So, I mean, it does feel like quite a lot of work. In the first instance, we had a great big class, which was done in probably about 20 minutes, whereas to get it to the stage where it is now, having thought about how to separate the commands out, it does take a little bit longer, but each class now does a single thing well. So if there is a fault in that code, we can look to the single file that's probably got the fault. It's easier for us to diagnose whether it's a problem with the out of stock product code or whether it's a problem with the email code. Each class becomes easier to test. I mean, it's now not as easy as we'd like to test because we are calling some of the services directly to make the manual one easier to test. We probably would have injected a manual service so that we could mock that. But it is easier to test than having to test Mandrill and um, out of stock code together. The in interfaces enforce a common public API. So I can give that module to anyone and know that they should implement the interfaces if they wanted to add their own um, functionality towards my module. And it makes our dependencies easier to mock and be made more vis visible. So it's quite hard when we're thinking about code to try and understand how many dependencies our class actually has. It's easy when we're working away to start adding a dependency to logger, to start throwing in some more debug code. And all of a sudden, when you step back and look at a class, it's actually composed of quite a lot of objects. Because we use dependency injection in Magento 2, we can see when our class maybe is doing too much, and it's an indication that we should split that class up into its own responsibilities. So, I mean, if you want to see any of the source code, I know it's pretty fundamental to most people, but it's all on my GitHub on Mage Titans Mini, an example. And you can see the evolution of code from when it was its first horrible command all the way to what we've got in the final example. And yeah, thank you very much for your uh, attention, guys. Any questions? Fire away. Can uh, changing code like this affect performance overall? Yeah, so in Magento 2, there is a step where you have to compile all the dependency injection container things to make it work. So it won't affect runtime performance because we're actually compiling all of our DI assets on compile. But it, is, it, it does add some latency to what we have when we're just instantiating new objects. And if that's then magnified across the whole, sorry, if everyone's started to kind of uh, develop in this way, Will it then put a pronounced speed impact on things or not, even not, if it's compiled? Yeah, as soon as it's compiled, it goes back to what we've right. been seeing in Magento 1, or what I've witnessed in Magento 1 code. Okay. Um, it's just that the compile step can take quite a long time because it has to compile all the assets from the code that you've wrote and all the Magento 2 framework code. Yeah. So what it does is it takes those XML files and creates PHP classes from them so that instead of it being XML that PHP doesn't understand, it's a class where it says new X, Y, or Z, and it creates that for every part of our application. But yeah, once it's compiled, it's, it's yeah, not too once bad. Once it's actually in production, then it's absolutely fine, yeah. It's yeah. Cleaned up. Right. yeah. I mean, the two projects that we've put in production, we haven't noticed any issues with the DI performance. Uh, there are issues in other areas, but not related to what we've, we've found there. Thank you. Cool. Nice one. Well, thanks for your time. Any questions afterwards? I'll be having a beer. Come and let's have a chat. Thank you, James. Uh, it's really valuable uh, knowledge share there, the power of abstra abstraction and interfaces in Magento too, and a very good example, I think. Uh, we should be bearing that in mind with our code.